K.D. Lang has always been a fascinating musician and artist and uh, people always have to question her, her image, her orientation, what label to put on her music, what to call her, why she dresses in man, men's clothing. Um, and she addresses all these things. She t talks about, uh, you know, the Nashville people and Nashville country music power, you know, controlling folks, not accepting her, and uh, uh, never really having hit. She got exposure and values her time as a country singer, and she came into country loving the music and you know, being inspired by Patsy Cline especially, and uh, but Loretta Lynn and uh, Brenda Lee and you know all the really country torch and twang singers of of her childhood and uh, I mean her first album was almost cow punk I mean I won't call it Long Riders esque but closer to that than anything Nashville was producing at the time well, by the time this album in Juin came out I mean she had eschewed her country labeling and it was veering much more toward uh, pop styling and jazz torch kind of thing and, and that almost happened out of her hooking up and becoming intermeshed with the legend of Roy Orbison and the song Crying and she and Roy duetted on it for a film soundtrack and Roy passed away shortly after and his family asked her to perform the song at the tribute concert and uh, she, she she really I think became a household name off of that and uh, so this interview with Katie Lang is from later with Bob Costas April 28 1992 and it's I think the definitive statement and you can tell Costas won KD over by the end of the thing she appreciated the interview and the chance to speak in the manner that she did. So I think you'll enjoy the interview as much as she did. Thanks for staying up later. Katie Lang is with us tonight. Her new album is called Ingenue, and for lack of a better description, and it's always difficult to categorize you, more ballads, more torch singing, a movement away from uh, the country style that people most generally associate you with. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, basically because I... I didn't have the passion that it takes to make another country record for country music. It was, it's, it's a love affair that had ended. I'm not bitter towards the industry or anything. It was just, as an artist, it was time to make a move in, into a new direction. And you've always had about as many influences as an artist can possibly have. Yeah. You have so definitely. many things you like. People would be surprised if they said, Katie, write down your 50 favorite singers or performers. It would come from everywhere. Yeah, it would. And I, and I think that part of, of being a good artist is letting those come back, you know, regenerate and come back out of you. Still, it's interesting that you'd make the move at this point because commercially it's a little bit of a gamble. You win the Grammy in 1989 for Absolute Torch and Twang, and right now country's about as hot as country can be. Mm -hmm. Garth Brooks' album is number one, Rope in the Wind, not number one on the country charts, number one on the Billboard charts. Mm -hmm. And in the top 100 markets, in 45 of them, a country station, is the number one station in the market. Looks like now's the time. Yeah, now's the time definitely for tr traditional country music. And it's, it's uh, you, you know, making quite a mark on the music industry. But I was never really accepted as a mainstream country artist, so it wouldn't really have, I mean, I don't think it really would have ha made that much difference. Plus, it would have been completely detrimental to make a record that I didn't have soul for. Did you feel as if uh, you weren't properly embraced by the country world? Oh, there were certain periods in, in, in my career as a country artist where I thought I wasn't being, but I think retrospectively, I think that I had the best of everything. Um, I was successful sales-wise, and I did a lot of television, got a lot of media coverage, yet retained an alternative edge, which is a difficult thing to do, and I think, you know, being accepted by Nashville was never really, really what I wanted because I would have lost my alternative edge. When we talk about all of your influences 
and as I said, it's a long list. I guess, in what I've read and, and listening to you, the, if we had to identify just one, it would be Patsy Cline. Is that fair to say? Yeah, in my country, in, in my country music, definitely. Why Patsy Cline? What about her? Um, her approach to country was real honest and real gutsy, and I think that Patsy, as a woman in the 50s, displayed a lot of self-confidence and, and uh, kind of liberated behavior that wasn't really the norm back mm -hmm. then. Wasn't there a time where you believed there was almost, if this isn't overstating it, some sort of cosmic connection between you and Patsy Cline? Yeah, I still believe that. How, did, how do you believe it plays itself out? Um, well, at the, at, the, at the time of, at the beginning of my country career, um, I was influenced very, very, very much for her, by her, and it was a type of um, injection, almost, of her energy, and, and I got a very clear vi visu visualization of what I wanted to do with country music. Like, I wasn't really sure how I was going to enter the music industry, and then all of a sudden, I started listening to Patsy and had a very clear focus on what I wanted to do. Um, and that, in my opinion, was a type of incarnation of Patsy Cline's energy. Um, you know. Her producer, her producer <laughs> Owen Bradley, uh -huh. subsequently worked with you. Yeah. By your design, or was it just a, a coincidence? He spotted you and said... No, I, I chased him for a while. And uh, he wasn't convinced that he should work with me for a long time, but finally he, he acknowledged my desire. As a relatively young person, have you always gotten the stamp of approval from some of the, the veterans, be it in rock and roll or in country? Yeah, yeah, definitely. The veterans have been very supportive, very Minnie Pearl, Owen Bradley, Roy Orbison, people that I respect have in turn respected me, and it's been very motivating. Kitty Wells and Kitty Brenda Wells, Lee you Brenda performed Lee. with, right? Loretta Lynn. Mm -hmm. I guess the thing that a mainstream audience would be most familiar with would be the crying duet mm -hmm. with Roy Orbison. That really was moving. It was for me, too, to do it. Um, Roy's influence on my life, I mean, beyond musically, has been immense. He was just very powerful and very strong and, and quiet, very zen-like. He was like a tree, you know, very peaceful and very strong and very still. People thought he was, you know, quiet and shy and, and tragic, but he wasn't at all. He was very strong and very spiritual. How did the pairing on Crying come about? It was for a soundtrack called Hiding Out. Mm -hmm. um, and, they, and we were both a little tentative about doing crying as a duet because it's more of a a solo song but it it, it worked and i'm really glad it was a, a real joy to sing with roy oh. i read that uh during the the taping of the crying video you brushed cheeks with him mm -hmm. and we were sharing a mic and and uh we went down to sing something and it it well it was like i don't know it was like sort of a soft electricity going through. He had really soft skin and, it, and incredible energy. It was neat. You know what I always thought was the interesting thing among many about him? And I was talking with Dave Marsh on this show a couple of years ago and, uh, and I guess he wrote the, was it on Cinemax, the, the special? Mm -hmm. Cinemax mm -hmm. special that was a tribute uh, to Roy Orbison. So Dave is a lifelong fan. And I was talking with him about it and you, you look at Roy's material and in the hands of anybody else, it would be overblown, much too melodramatic, maudlin, seem insincere. You know, but in his hands, it rang so true that it was, it was a tribute not just to his talent, but to the sincerity of his heart. Definitely. Definitely. You take a song like Pretty Woman, mm -hmm. which obviously is a great pop rock song just by the sound of it. But by the lyrics, with almost anybody else, it would almost be a sleazy song. Right. But in his hands, it's poignant. Yeah. You can feel his vulnerability and his, mm -hmm. and his loneliness. Exactly. He was very vulnerable. He, 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 he allowed that to come through, and I think that that's part of being a good artist, is, is allowing yourself to be vulnerable. And he definitely did that. I would think it also makes it difficult to cover 
his material, although you have and others have, but you gotta be careful. Yeah, I see, I would have never, ever covered crying, and but the only reason I, f I feel the freedom to do it is because I've had the experience and it almost seems right that I should sing Crying Now is asked by his wife, Barbara, to sing it um, at the Songwriters Hall, in Hall of Fame, which he was inducted to. And, uh, you know, I carry the torch for Roy, really. Not, I don't try to make it really my own, but carry the torch for him. How dramatic was it to sing on that occasion, to sing his song so soon after his death? It was immense, but I, I wasn't really mourning because I knew that he... I, I didn't really feel, I mean, obviously it's, it's a loss on, in the physical sense, but, but uh, his music and his energies it's, it's, has influenced us so much that it's, he remains. I saw you in person. I was in the audience uh, at Saturday Night Live. It was probably a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And you did that old Joni Summers song from the 60s, Johnny Get Angry, and yeah. you did it to the hilt. Yeah. I probably did. I mean, you were dead by, by song's end, you were down on your knees, you were <laughs> pounding the stage. Well, I'm a little over dramatic sometimes, Bob, but <laughs> no, I, I tried to perform that with a sense of humor um, about, you know, songs from, was it from the 50s? I think it was like 62, 62. or somewhere in there. Yeah, I was just sort of making a joke on the, you know, that a woman would sing, I want a brave man, I want a caveman. Show me that you care. You like these campy performances, though. Not all of your performances are campy, but no. there, there's certainly a tongue-in-cheek aspect to a lot of what you do, right? Definitely. I, I love um, kitschness. I love over-dramatization, over-dramatizing things. I love um, theater. I love humor, and I think that it's all part of life and being an entertainer, that you have to encompass those things. You have to be able to laugh at yourself. and. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I have fun with my art and I couldn't do it if I, you know, squelched it. Do you like the fact as well that people can't get a handle on your image? I read somewhere where you said you feel you have a cryptic sexuality. I don't even know if that's true. I, tr I said true that. that. You said it? I did, I did say that. I don't even know if it's true because, you know, whatever. It, uh, my sexuality is whatever anyone wants to think it is, so, it, you know, it doesn't... I mean, yeah, I said that, and in, in, in some sense, I guess it's cryptic, but I, I don't really know. Like, I don't sit at home going, okay, uh, I'm going to do this to make people think that. I mean, really, it's just following my natural course. Um, I feel most comfortable dressing in, you know, men's clothes or whatever, and um, it's, it's not really a contrived thing. It's not thought out or premeditated. It's, I'm aware of its you know, ramifications or whatever, but I don't, you know. I saw the video that's kind of a, uh, an overview of your career, takes it chronologically. Your early stages, your hair was somewhat longer. Then in the middle, just I guess kind of as an impulsive thing, boom, you shaved it almost bald. And yeah. then you came on stage like maybe 10 days after that, and it was, it was crew cut style. It what was, was chunky. What was the reaction from the audience? <laughs> <laughs> well, See, I, I, see, what happened was, is I started to experience, I guess, fame. And uh, I, get, I did it unconsciously, but I, was get, I always used to cut my own hair. And I was in the mirror giving myself a haircut, and I just kept going. I just couldn't stop, and I, I ended up bald. <laughs> that is the end result if you carry it to its logical <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> and I... I it really worked because I, it, my vanity, you know, that was starting to grow rapidly was nil. It went back to zero and it was really good. It was a good exercise and I said it was unconscious. But I, that night after my haircut, I had to perform in front of 3,500 people, which was huge for me at the time. And so I wore this hat and then in the middle of the performance I went, okay. And I took the hat off and I, I heard 3,500 people go, oh! and I went, burst through that cloud. It was great. And I think it helps. It really. does help, definitely. I think it's a device that that puts you a leg up somehow. Hard to define exactly how, but somehow. Yeah, again, but I think I'm blind to it. I, I do it really 
um, I just do these things, um, and I don't really think of the outcome. I just end up doing them, and then after I go, that is exactly what I needed. Do you? Katie Lang, and this is Lulu. We're with the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. We all love animals, but why do we call some pets and some dinner? If you knew how meat was made, you'd lose your lunch. I know, I'm from cattle country, and that's why I became a vegetarian. Meat stinks, and not just for the animals, but for human health and the environment. How much trouble did the, uh, did the anti-beef commercials get you into in your hometown? Oh, lots. Lots. It was a heavy, heavy time. More so from, from my family, I think, because my mother still lives there, and, and my sister, one of my sisters lived there. And I think that the biggest shock was that um, after eight years or so of, of having a very smooth, very positive career and a steady climb, I'd never really been criticized in the press, other, other than, you know, small incidental things. And I think it was really hard for my mother to realize that, you know, <laughs> this is bound to happen. I mean, and I've always been quite outspoken about things, and this was a big one, I think. Isn't beef part of the, uh, the economy back where you came from? Yeah, probably the, the big one. Was that, was that really it? Yeah, that was it. That's what did it? Yeah, I th yeah, I think so. I, well, I think it's a combination. I think, first of all, when, it's, uh, when it has to do with money, yeah, it's very touchy. Um, and secondly, it has to do with a lifestyle. It's, it's a very romantic North American lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and thirdly, it, 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 they, I think people felt betrayed that a country singer, their, you know, their own hometown girl would go against their, their you know, livelihood. Um, it, it was all very dramatic and all very uh, up upsetting, but um, it's my belief, and I've said it for 11 years, that vegetarianism is something very important and something I believe that is very important to the evolution of human beings. So you don't have any regrets about doing it? No, absolutely none. Did it cost you airplay, you think? Because <laughs> no. they threatened Who are that. are you kidding? I never got airplay. You never got enough country airplay. I never got airplay. I mean, the, the stations that banned me never played me. Um, it was all just, and it was a very big indication of how strong um, advertising dollars are in radio. But no, they never played me. You know, I, now I, I read that as I go through the research that you get strangely little airplay relative to your success, and yet you're very well known, you're on TV a lot, mm -hmm. your records sell well, so why wouldn't the airplay kind of parallel that? Um, well, I think in the past, my country, uh, um, you know, style has sort of fallen in between the cracks. It's, it's, it's too left of center for, for radio stations. They don't want to embrace my look. They don't want to subscribe to who and, and what I am. I mean, I think that they've loved sort of, ha in, you know, having me around to give a new audience to country music, but um, they don't want to be responsible for me. Um, and it's and it's mutual. See, to me, the thing that would come through, and I, I, I'm not trying to patronize you by saying this, so they they don't quite know what to make of the look, or they don't quite know what to make of the style. But the thing that comes through stronger than anything is here's someone who's really committed to this, not as a commercial vehicle, but someone who has a genuine love for it and a passion for it. Someone who's expressing herself while at the same time paying tribute to people who she enjoyed and who influenced her. I mean, to me, that's the thing. Well, thank you. You're, you're very perceptive. That's how I approach it, and that's how I, I try to approach my art. Thank you. Ask you this before we go. Okay. Why the small letters on no, KD? No, absolutely no reason. It's so, not an E. Cummings thing sorry. or something like that? Well, I do remember a poster in high school, but no. No, I'm sorry. Nothing profound. And the real name is Catherine, right? Catherine Dawn. Just for all of you at home writing a term paper or something. Craft dinner, Lang? Mm hmm That's what I tell most people. And it's good enough for us because we're out of time. We have no time for a follow-up, and see you later. <laughs>